Good morning. Good morning. So, Caitlin, we define as a child here anyone under the age of 60-something. Just, so. <laughs> just, just, just so. okay, Well, I didn't want to, but, but I, I thought I would... I thought I would have stopped there. Okay, under 70 if you're game. Under 100. Okay. We're all children of Well, in that case, it's 101 because we have one gentleman, 101, not in here today, but in our other worship service. <coughs> the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we are delighted to be in your presence this morning, to be able to come together safely and securely to worship you in spirit and in truth. We give you thanks for this household of faith, um, all who worship here today, the opportunity to share our lives with each other and with you. We thank you for creating us in your own image, redeeming us by the blood of the Lamb and sanctifying us and sustaining us by your Holy Spirit. Uh, We come now seeking a word from you, a word of sustenance, and encouragement, uh, and support that we may hold up under our various storms in life. Um, We thank you for being God all by yourself and for loving us unconditionally, eternally, in all places, at all times, no matter what. You are our hope, our rock, and our salvation. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. My sermon text for today is the uh, Old Testament lesson assigned for today. (laughs) I like your shirt, I'm just now saying it. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 1 through 12. My sermon title for today is Mutuality. Mutuality. As you may recall, Isaiah was a prophet and likely a priest as well, who lived in Jerusalem and Judah in the 7th and 8th century B.C. He prophesied during the reigns of a few kings, most notably Ahaz and Hezekiah. His closest prophetic colleagues would have been Amos, Hosea, and Micah. Throughout Israel's history, the sins most often castigated and condemned, and for which they are actually sent into exile, are really only two. Number one, idolatry, that is the worship of false gods. And number two, social injustice namely oppression of the poor. Scholars typically divide the book of Isaiah into three sections, reflecting three different periods of time in the life of God's chosen people, Israel. Chapters 1 through 39, the bulk called simply 1st Isaiah, uh, which occur prior to the exile to Babylon. Chapters 40 to 55, called 2nd Isaiah, during the time of exile. And chapters 56 through 66, finally, called 3rd Isaiah after the return from that exile. Accordingly, we find ourselves this morning in 3rd Isaiah, when the people of Israel mercifully have been allowed to return home from exile in Babylon because the Persian Empire has now defeated Babylonia and allowed exiled populations to return to their ancestral homelands. Today's passage much like like much prophetic critique, is harsh, stinging, difficult to hear. God is more than a little angry, sternly rebukes his chosen people, and does so with more than a little bitter sarcasm. Shout out, do not hold back, God cries out to his prophet Isaiah. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Cry out full-throated and unsparingly, the New American Bible translates here. Man, I would hate to be in Isaiah's sandals. Sarcasm which follows goes beyond biting. Yet day after day they seek me, says the Lord. They delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast but you do not see? The people grumble and complain to God. Humble ourselves but you do not notice. Their genuine attempts at humility are supported by verse number 5 
where they are actually bowing down their heads and donning sackcloth and ashes, which are tangible ancient signs of penitence. Can anyone identify this morning with these ancient supplicants of Israel? Does anyone know what it's like to seek God, not be able to find Him? To genuinely and desperately seek God's face and see at best His back. To day after day seek Him. To delight to know His ways. To ask of Him righteous judgments. You only want what's right. To delight to draw near to God. You just want a closer relationship with God that will bring with it strength and comfort and guidance and security and vindication Why do we fast, O Lord, but you do not see? Why do we humble ourselves, and yet you take no notice? Translation, I tithe 10% of my income, and I still can't catch a financial break. Still sinking in debt. I worship faithfully and regularly, only to go home to the same old, same old. I come to Bible study. I live a good and decent and moral life, actually obeying most of the Ten Commandments most of the time. I play by the rules. I really do. And I've got to deal with all this chaos and confusion in my life. Those backbiting relatives, this broken down physical body, this overwhelming emotional stress, my job. My lack of one. I'm trying to seek you, Lord, to know your ways, to draw near to you, to fast with humility, and yet you are nowhere to be found. Absent, gone, disappeared, invisible, off the scene. Are you like me? Did you grow up hearing... The message that what rendered you acceptable to God, what made you good and or holy and or saved was your own personal morality. You smoke, not good. Non-smoker, good. You drink, not good. Non-drinker, good. You cuss, not good. Non-cusser, good. Have sex, no good. Abstain, good. Listen to secular music, not good. Gospel music, good. Morality was almost exclusively defined as what you did with you. How you viewed and treated other people rarely, if ever, even came up. You could be the most hateful, ornery, mean, spiteful, surly, curmudgeonly, racist, sexist person on earth. And if you didn't smoke, drink, cuss, have sex outside of marriage, and listen to the Gaither vocal band... You were just fine, (laughs) admired, and emulated even. Much like ancient Israel then, we too are God's chosen people. We too are beloved by God. We too are seeking God, His ways, His righteous judgments, intimacy with Him. And we too are equally blind and lost. Look. God says in verse number 3, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and fight, to strike with wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. How many of you just want your voice heard on high? Is such the fast I choose, says God? Will you call this a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast I choose, says the Lord? And you don't see anything concerning drinking, smoking, cussing, sex, or gospel music in what follows. Rather than morality being defined individually, it is defined communally. Everything that follows, everything deals with how you treat other 
people. Loose the bonds of injustice. Undo the thongs of the yoke. Let the oppressed go free. Break every yoke. A yoke, by the way, is something that burdens or weighs down someone. Share your bread with the hungry. Bring the homeless poor into your house. When you see the naked, cover them. Do not hide yourself from the needs of your own kin or family. Remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil. Offer your food to the hungry. Satisfy the needs of the afflicted. Such a concern for other people, my friends, especially the poor, needy, weak, and vulnerable is all throughout Scripture. Isaiah 2. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I've had enough of your offerings. Your assemblies and feast in my name, I hate them. They burden me and I am weary of them. Even though you pray a lot, I will not listen. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Amos 5. I hate, I despise your feast, says God. And your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me all these offerings, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise, the noise of your songs, the melody of your harps, your worship and praise stuff. Instead, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. James 1, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, simply to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. And in the only place in the entire Bible where Jesus himself teaches on the sheep and the goats, heaven and hell, who goes where and why, Matthew 25, it is 100% based on how we treat others, especially those who are poor, needy, and vulnerable. Heaven therein is reserved for those who feed the hungry and thirsty, welcome the stranger, clothe the naked, visit those who are sick and imprisoned. And hell therein is reserved for all those who turn a blind eye or a deaf ear to the cries and needs of the least of these in our world, in our society. From the very beginning, we are created in community with other human beings and called to compassionately care for one another and to do justice in every arena. Genesis 2, God said it is not good for the man to be alone. Genesis 4, Cain asked God, am I my brother's keeper? Answer, yes. Matthew 7, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Translation, if you were in their shoes, what would you need from you? 1 Corinthians 12, we are all members of one body. If one suffers, all suffer together. If one is honored, all rejoice together. 1 John 4, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother or sister, they are a liar. James 2, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world? If you see someone ill-clad and lacking food and you say, go in peace without giving them what they need, what good is that? As a human race, we have managed to convince ourselves that poor people deserve their poverty. They have earned it. They have merited it. And yet, apart from a couple passages in Proverbs, which could be interpreted thusly, Scripture after Scripture after Scripture after Scripture after Scripture testifies to God's special concern for the poor and to how our love of God is evidenced in our care for them. There exists in today's text some if-then statements implying that it is in fact possible for us to heed God's instruction to care for those in need. The word if appears in verses 9 and 10, followed by what God desires of us. And the word then appears in verses 8, 9, and 10, followed by what God will do for us. You've heard the ifs. Let's look at the thens, shall we? Verse 8. Then... Your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. I like that. 
my healing is affected by my love and providing for somebody else. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Verse number 9. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help and God will say, Here I am. How many of you just want to hear those very words from God? Here I am. Verse number 10. Then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom shall be like the midday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. You shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt and you shall rise up the foundation, raise up the foundations of many generations. You, you whom Jesus referred to in this morning's gospel lesson from Matthew 5 as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You shall be called also the repairer of the breach and the restorer of streets to live in. According to all these thens, my healing lies in my helping someone else to heal. My hearing God's voice lies in my being God's voice to someone else. Your audience with a holy and loving God is found alongside the weak and the vulnerable's audience with you. Your restoration is intimately bound up with your participation and someone else's restoration. It is more blessed for you to give, in other words, than it is to receive. If you lose your life in this scheme, then you gain it. If you leave and give up houses and family and possessions and lands for the sake of the gospel, you will actually receive a hundredfold more in this lifetime. If you deny yourself pick up your cross and follow Jesus, then you are a true disciple. We have a God, my friends, who loved us so much, He decided to share our lot, to become one of us, to suffer what we suffer and thereby redeem it. And in so doing, He calls us, beckons us to have the same mind, to share the lot of others, to suffer with them and to aid in their freedom and restoration. Because we've got a lot more power than we think. We have a lot more influence on people's lives than we consider. A lot more capability to change people's lives in the world than we can ever possibly imagine. And we are given the precious opportunity to take Isaiah 58 today truly and utterly to heart and actually participate in the liberation of someone else. Christ makes it all possible. Mutuality. Mutuality.